Ready? All right. <laughs> All right, ready? Yep. Dan, why don't you wear a pith helmet like this? Uh, it's not really. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Bam. Okay. Boo. Wow. Follow the shot, will you? If, if I go off, I want to. The thing is, when I BS on an answer, you're not going to know. That's true. <laughs> so I'll just be rapping. Wow. Really? Really? Okay. Um, what are you doing here at Dinosaur Park? At Dinosaur National Monument, our main concentration is in activities is working here on the cliff trying to expose um, as many of the bones as we can find here. There are other activities in the park. We are starting to look in other areas. Um, last year we found over 100 new localities. Wow. Uh, not any of them will probably be anywhere near as productive as this, but it does hint that there is still a great deal of work to be done at Dinosaur National Monument. Now, you are excavating these bones? In a sense, Excavating uh, usually refers to taking them out of the rock, and that's something we're not doing here. If we took every bone that we found out of the rock, in another 15 years we'd have this building built over a blank cliff, which wouldn't be a very good exhibit. We are trying to expose in high relief, or in other words, remove as much of the rock away from the bone as we can without having the bone roll down the cliff, and then leaving it in a permanent in-place exhibit. So in a sense, if you come here, to the monument and look at the quarry, you're seeing the bones in the exact position they were deposited in a river sandbar 140 million years ago. 140 million years. Uh, describe the process of uh, revealing these bones. Well, as you can see, we have about three or four feet of rock that needs to be taken off before we get back near to the main bone layer. And that work is done with uh, big air hammers. But once we get back to the area we know most of the bones are concentrated, virtually all the work is done with small hand tools, uh, ice pick sized chisels and small hammers. How long a process, how, long would it, how many hours would it take to reveal this bone? That's a common question, but unfortunately there isn't a single answer. Uh, it depends on how well the bone was preserved. Uh, if the bone laid on the surface of the river uh, sandbar for a while, it may have uh, weathered badly and it's much more poorly preserved, which means it takes uh, longer and more careful work to expose it. Also, the shape of the bone uh, determines how fast you can expose it. A bone like this, which is a hip bone of a brontosaur, has a lot of nice, <clears throat> broad, flat surfaces. And so one can work fairly fastly on that. But if you are working on a vertebrae uh, with a lot of very thin struts and processes and very convoluted surfaces, it becomes uh, a slower process. So I can't give you a single answer, except that uh, in the six-month season every year that we spend here on the cliff, probably 50 bones or so are exposed. So it's a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. a lot of hours. Uh, who found this quarry? Who discovered the bones here? Earl Douglas discovered it. He was a paleontologist working for the Carnegie Museum. And the Carnegie wanted a large brontosaur skeleton to mount in their dinosaur hall. And Douglas knew from geologic maps that these rocks were the right age. They had produced brontosaurs in other areas. And he simply did what paleontologists do today, uh, <clears throat> go out in the hot uh, badlands and walk up all of the gullies looking for bone exposed. And uh, in August of 1909, he found eight tail vertebrae articulated, in other words, like this, uh, in the same position as they were when the animal was alive. And that was the initial discovery. He had suspicions, as you can tell from his diary on that day, that he may have found the articulated skeleton he was looking for. But in reality, he had discovered what turned out to be the largest dinosaur quarry 
ever found anywhere in the world, although at the time there was no way to know it. And then he began, sure. So Douglas finds the vertebra. What's the next step? He uh, starts to uncover them uh, following them out using hand chisels. Uh, yeah, sorry, small hammers and chisels, uh, much what we do here today. He was lucky in that the eight tail vertebrae uh, continued into what turned out to be one of the densest parts of the quarry, so that within a month he had found parts of two other brontosaurs laying across the one that he had found. And looking at his diary, uh, even at that time, he was starting to muse that it might take a bit longer than he had thought uh, to finish excavating the specimen. Wouldn't he love to see what it looks like today? Yeah, and at, in reality, uh, Douglas had at one time suggested that maybe the excavation should stop and in terms of taking bone out and that a building could be built either nearby or over the quarry uh, for people to visit and see what's going on. And in reality, in a sense, this is uh, Douglas's dream come true. I mean, the job of the paleontologist really hasn't changed much in 70 years, has it? I mean, it's the same tools as hammers and chisels and hard work. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, paleontologists basically stole their skills from stonemasons. When the first uh, dinosaur skeletons were found in England in the 1800s, they were, of course, in rock. And in fact, they were in stone quarries. And it was the techniques used by stonemasons for working stone that were adapted to taking fossils out of the rock. And although there have been some improvements in the kinds of maybe adhesives we use, we now use epoxy glues, for example, most of the work is still done by hand using chisels and hammers. Uh, the fossils are fairly brittle, and you need to use small hand tools uh, and work slowly, because if you break one, it, would, it can often take longer to repair it than if you'd simply gone slowly in uh, uncovering it in the beginning. When we say the word fossil, we think that this bone has turned completely to stone. Is that true? Not really. Uh, if you look at bone in a living animal, you can think of it as a sponge. There's a hard um, framework to it, which would be the sponge, and all the spaces are filled with blood vessels and soft tissues, bones that lay down, uh, excuse me, cells that lay down bony tissue. And when the animal dies, all that soft tissue rots and those spaces are filled in, in the case here at the quarry, with silica. But the actual hard framework of the bone itself doesn't decay. So that tests that have been done on the bone here from the quarry indicate that about 50% of it is unaltered. It's chemically identical to when it was inside the dinosaur. 140 million years ago. Uh, Dan, why are you a paleontologist? Do you want another truthful answer to that? <laughs> to meet girls, right? <laughs> Um, most children have uh, an interest in dinosaurs and prehistoric life. Some people think in part because it, is, it appeals to one's fantasy world, but still is, in a sense, rooted in reality because we know that they did exist. Um, I became interested in dinosaurs basically from watching uh, King Kong and those kinds of movies. <laughs> when I was young and went through the same stage that many children do, only instead of deciding to become a heart surgeon or an astronaut, I just never grew out of it and simply uh, stayed interested in dinosaurs. Is it still exciting every day? Oh, yeah. What are the major discoveries? What, excuse me, what have we learned? Let me try that again. Uh, what new information has been added thanks to this quarry? Well, the quarry is uh, unique in many respects. Uh, in part, it, it gives us the best view of an entire community of animals 140 million years ago. There are many other quarries in the same formation that this is located in, but none of them have the diversity uh, that is found here. For example, there are 10 species of dinosaurs, but in addition to dinosaurs, there are uh, frogs and lizards, turtles, crocodilians, um, a very good sample of animals that were living along the shorelines of the streams, as well as the dinosaurs. And for most other quarries, you don't see that mixing of the community, and that good of a sample. So it gives us a very good picture of the dinosaurs and the non-dinosaurs that were alive at the time. One unusual thing for the... Wait, fro sure. Frogs coexisted? In fact, 